Welcome. Welcome to Convocation. How many of you are here for the first time? Raise your hand. A few of you. Wonderful. Welcome. Glad to see you. Uh, we have a special guest speaker today that we're very excited about. Um, before we get started, though, just a few brief announcements. For those of you who are Snow College students, Weeds, which is the Snow student-run literary journal, is now accepting submissions of fiction, nonfiction poetry, and visual art. The deadline for that is February 15th. So if you're interested in submitting, you can go online, snow.edu backslash weeds. Okay, and then also just a little housekeeping issues. Just a reminder that this is a live studio audience. This is being recorded and live streamed. Uh, so if you need to exit, please do so quietly. But if at all possible, please refrain from leaving until the program is over. Um, everybody get out your cell phones right now. Turn them off so that we don't interfere. Um, and that is much appreciated. Now, those of you who are taking this class for credit, if you still don't have your yellow attendance card, you can get it from the TA after class, or you can get it all the way up until next Wednesday, February 4th, in the TA's office, and those office hours are located on Canvas. And then finally, next Thursday, we will be hearing a, a presentation. One of the ABC4 news uh, anchor people will be coming down, and they'll be sharing with us a brand new just recently released documentary um, celebrating Black History Month in February. So we will be enjoying that next Thursday. And now I would like to turn the time over to Professor Ted Olson, and he will introduce our special guest. Today we're uh, very privileged to have with us Dr. Reyes. He is the uh, co-founder and co-designer of New Scale Power, which is a uh, technology that is cutting edge with regard to small scale modular reactors. And he's going to uh, tell us about this today a little bit. Just a little bit of background about him. He uh, uh, graduated from the University of Florida, with a bachelor's degree and master's and doctor's degrees from the University of Maryland. He's a uh, person that has traveled and lectured worldwide. He has, uh, in fact, uh, been part of the uh, collaboration team for the United Nations in evaluating passive uh, safety devices for nuclear reactors. He has uh, also been the department chair head at Oregon State University for Nuclear Engineering. And I have seen, personally, the one-third scale model of the thing that he's going to tell you about today, and it works. <laughs> and that's exciting. He has uh, given numerous uh, talks and publications, and has been the recipient of many awards uh, that have all distinguished him as a world-class scientist and nuclear engineer, which we're just delighted to have him here today to talk about the uh, new scale reactor. So uh, without further ado, Dr. Reyes, the podium is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, and I'm, I'm, I'm truly honored to be here today. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, Professor Olson, Professor Benson organizing this event. Uh, it's, it's, I get very passionate about this technology, so if I start talking too fast, someone in the front row needs to raise their hands, say, slow down, slow down, so I get excited. Uh, so I am the, 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 the co-founder of New Scale Power and the co-inventor, uh, and I, I currently serve as the chief technology officer for, for our company in Oregon, New Scale Power. So today I'm going to talk about our uh, small module reactor that we've been uh, working on. Uh, I started this project back in 2000, so for me this is my 15th year uh, working on this project. So this technology has evolved quite a bit. Uh, that we've, we've learned a lot and we've, we've made some am amazing advancements, and I'm going to show you some of those today. Uh, we, we do have a one-third scale electrically heated version of the design, which models the reactor, the containment, uh, and the, uh, the cooling pool that it would sit in. Uh, we started working with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission back in 2008 
to get them familiar with our design so that they uh, will, when it comes time to review our concept, they'll know exactly how it works. Uh, we built our 12 uh, module reactor simulator. So it's a control room uh, that uh, is used by operators. We have several senior reactor operators currently working in that laboratory space to develop the layout, all the human factors part of, the, of that design. Uh, the company has grown immensely. Uh, I started the company I had uh, with four base patents. These are four patents in the US. Uh, and the amount of innovation, the amount of excitement around what we're doing uh, has, has grown uh, the, the, uh, the number of patents to 185 patents in 19 countries. Uh, it, it, it's a different kind of company. Uh, it's, it's very exciting. We have, uh, we have uh, our senior mentors working with, uh, with uh, young uh, engineers uh, developing a design that I believe is going to change the future of the world. Uh, this is just a tremendous, uh, a tremendous uh, thing that's happening. We've grown to over 550 uh, full-time employees working on this project. We have four offices, uh, one in Corvallis, Oregon, next to Oregon State University. Uh, the, our business office in Portland. We just recently opened up an office in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And then we have a, a Washington, D.C. office across from the regulator. Uh, most recently, uh, we've, uh, we were in a competition for uh, dollars from the federal government uh, to, to move uh, this technology forward. Uh, and we were successful in our bid. Uh, we now have $217 million in matching grant funds available to move us forward to the design certification and beyond. Uh, in addition, Floor is, uh, if you're not familiar with Floor Corporation, very large, uh, one of the largest uh, engineering procurement uh, construction uh, firms in the country, uh, have, has invested over $230 million to date. So the company is doing very well uh, and we're making great progress. So let me get uh, into the description of the design a little bit. Uh, it's relatively small. If you've ever seen a nuclear power plant, the thing that might impress you the most is a large containment dome uh, that, that you, you would see. Now what we've done is we've gone to a very small containment. So this little device in the middle there in the center of, the, of your screen uh, is the module. And volume-wise, uh, we could fit about 126 of these modules into a standard pressurized water reactor containment that you might see today. So it's much, much smaller. A single module is about 75 feet long and about 15 feet in diameter. Uh, and each module produces about 50 megawatts of electricity. That's the gross power. So that gives you kind of a sense compared to the large 1,000 to, to 1,500 megawatt plants that, that you may have, uh, be familiar with. So it's a very small module. So for us, one module uh, would power a, a, about a city about the size of Corvallis, 45 to 50,000 people, just to give you kind of a sense of, of, of that. It's a very different uh, concept for how we would build uh, these, these plants. So the idea is that we would manufacture these in a factory. Uh, so the nice thing about that is that all of our forgings can be uh, obtained right here in the U.S. We've identified at least six different uh, forge masters who can produce our vessels. Uh, so they're small, about nine feet in diameter for the reactor vessel, about uh, 15 feet in diameter for the, the containment vessels. Uh, factory built, uh, they can be shipped in three parts, uh, on, by truck, rail, or barge to the site. So the idea is that while you're building, you're doing all your concrete work on the site, uh, you're manufacturing in the, in, in, the, in the factory. And so now we've cut the time to construct the nuclear plant by about half, uh, because you're not doing all your nuclear construction, the big containment domes, uh, on site. So it's, it's a parallel construction. You finish the plant, all the concrete, you build a big pool, and then you deliver the modules and you insert the modules. So it's a, it's a different kind of a model. Each one of the, the modules uh, is connected then to a skid-mounted turbine generator set. So these are small turbine generator sets. They're commercially available, about 50 megawatt uh, turbines. Uh, the nice feature of those is that they can be delivered to the site also as a, as a component. Uh, and then you couple one module to one skid-mounted turbine generator set, and that's your power unit. So that works quite well. Again, very flexible, allows you to, to add modules as you need modules. Uh, <clears throat> this is designed so that once you build the main structure, the, the big reactor pool in the middle, uh, you can start off with one or two modules. You can add additional modules as modules are needed. So we try to provide flexibility. Uh, it's not, uh, adding modules is not a construction project. It's just an installation. You're installing additional modules, similar to the way we would refuel a plant. Uh, one of the big differences in our design is that because we're refueling in a, in a uh, staggered manner, you can imagine you refuel one module, 
and two years, uh, every module is good for two years of operation at full power, two to four years. Uh, and you can, you can uh, refuel these in a staggered manner. So you refuel module number one, uh, and you put that back. Uh, and while you're doing the refueling for one module, the rest of the plant continues to produce power. So that plant has a very high capacity factor because you're always producing power uh, because you're, you're only taking 50 megawatts off the grid at any one time. So it's a very, very different type of design. Also, in terms of the, uh, how you perform your maintenance and your refueling for these types of plants, uh, you're using in-house crew. Uh, the folks who are doing the work are actually regular full-time employees of the plant. If you're not familiar with nuclear power today, uh, for the large plants, they typically will shut down the plant, so you lose 1,000 megawatts off the grid. Uh, and then they'll bring in construction uh, and maintenance people uh, who will, uh, it could be 800 to 1,200 people off-site, and you have to put them through security clearance, they have to go through drug screening, they have to go through uh, uh, health physics training. There's a whole range of things that have to be done every time you bring someone on that site. Well, with this plant, they're already a permanent part of the, uh, of the site because you're refueling very small modules on a regular basis uh, as opposed to trying to do everything all at once. So it's, it really has a lot of nice uh, design features to it. Uh, in terms of power, uh, I mentioned 50 megawatts, that's the gross power. Uh, the net output is about 570 megawatts for a 12-module plant. Uh, it's it's a, a light water reactor. We're just using regular water. Uh, and it's the, the secondary side is, is pretty common of what you'd expect from, uh, uh, from uh, power production today. So it's a steam. Uh, we do produce a significant amount of superheat, which adds to our efficiency for the design. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, this normal operation. What is a reactor? What does it do? Uh, that kind of thing. So basically, <coughs> excuse me, basically uh, what we have is a, a nuclear reactor uh, that sits inside of a, a steel, I would call a, a thermos, that sits underwater, underground. I'll let you think about that while I drink some more. A nuclear reactor that sits inside of a steel containment thermos bottle, basically, underwater, underground. That's the whole concept. You're all now nuclear engineers. <clears throat> it's fairly simple, uh, but it, pr it provides an unprecedented level of safety. You, it, it's such it's a, a simple concept, yet it works so well. It's so efficient. In the reactor portion of it, we have uh, the nuclear core, where the fission occurs. We're using uranium as our fuel. Uh, you fission the uranium, it produces heat, and that heat will heat up the water. And I'll show you a video here. Uh, that water then rises just because of the lower density. Warm water rises, the cool water will drop. So this video kind of illustrates that. And I'll narrate for you. So this is our module. This includes the containment and the reactor vessel. So here you see the reactor vessel inside the containment. We track the control rods. Now you start the fission reactor reaction begins. So you're producing heat. The hot water rises, so kind of like a chimney. It flows out the top of the central riser. And on the outside of the riser, we have two independent helical coil steam generators. It's kind of like a DNA, intertwined. And so uh, we have water boiling inside those tubes coming from the outside and sending steam out. Uh, but the water inside the tubes never comes in contact with the water inside the reactor. It's just the heat transfer through the walls. The cold water drops just by density difference to complete the cycle. So there's no reactor coolant pumps in this design. We don't need pumps to drive the flow, so we've eliminated one whole area of potential uh, uh, mishaps. On the secondary side, the water is flowing inside the tubes and boiling to produce superheated steam. So There's no separators or dryers, and we're going then to a standard off-the-shelf turbine generator set. Uh, and we've, we've been working with different companies to optimize the, the, uh, the, the stages of the turbine uh, to, produce, uh, to increase our efficiencies. So we have the, the, the turbine generator, which is connected then to the, the generator. So the generator is producing electricity, which then goes to the grid. Uh, we have a standard uh, condenser, so a condenser box. So the secondary side of the plant looks very much like a, a fossil fuel plant or other types of plants. It's just a, a, a standard ranking cycle. 
Because they're small, our, our electrical generators don't need to be hydrogen cooled. In the large plants with large megawatts, you have to use hydrogen cooling. In this design, you can use air cooling or water cooling. So each of these power units then really is, is independent uh, in the sense that, uh, that each unit is not cross-connected to another unit. And as a result, you can install modules as modules are needed. Uh, one of the features of the design also is because it's small, we can also go to air cooling. Uh, so if, if water resources are limited, uh, there's an opportunity to use this in an air cooling mode on the condenser side, which really reduces the water consumption. Uh, we've done a lot of work to uh, improve the reliability of the plant just by design. So what we've done is we've looked at all the previous, uh, and this is the 2012 information, we looked at all the previous events of what causes a nuclear power plant to shut down. And by design, we've eliminated over 80% of those just by design. Those components either don't exist uh, or uh, because of our design, uh, we're able to overcome those, those, those challenges. So we've, we've done quite a bit of work in making this a very reliable plant. Uh, this just shows you a cross-section of a 12-module reactor building. Here's the top view over here. Uh, so these buildings are very robust. It's a seismic category one building. So uh, we've designed this building uh, with what we call a, a, a 0.5G uh, zero period acceleration. So 0.5G is sort of the basis that, that we use. Just to give you a sense of scale, uh, the events at Fukushima, they were around 0.3 to 0.4G. So this is already designed to withstand uh, g-forces larger than what was experienced at, uh, at Fukushima. Uh, so it, it, is, it is a modern, uh, modern technology. Big part of it is because it's embedded in the earth so that the pool actually resides below ground and as a result you have much better seismic performance. Designed for earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods. Uh, and we also had to design it for aircraft impact. So that's one of the, the newest rules. So this is a post 9-11 design. We do have a separate below ground control room that's, that's not shown here. Our site's about 44 acres. This is for the 12 module plant. We, we've looked at other combinations of, uh, of modules. Uh, just to give you a sense there, so about 44 acres in, in size inside the fence. Okay, let's talk about safety a little bit. We've worked very hard to come up with a design that is, is, tr is uh, the next level of safety for nuclear power. Uh, and a lot of it just happens by physics, okay, just by convection, uh, conduction, these types of heat transfer, uh, buoyancy effects which drive flow. Uh, these things are part of nature and we, we use that to our, to, to our benefit. So when you go, uh, just for example, if you take a cylinder and you reduce it in size, uh, for the same wall thickness you can go to much higher pressures. So a typical nuclear power plant containment today is designed to withstand about 65 pounds per square inch of pressure in that big concrete containment dome. In this design, uh, we can go well over 650 pounds per square inch just by going smaller. So we really haven't used much more material. We've just gone, taken advantage of going smaller. We have about four times the water volume per megawatt thermal, so a lot more water. Uh, in our simulator, when, you, when, you, when our uh, operators run different scenarios on a simulator, these transients, these events evolve very, very slowly. So operators have a lot of time to respond to any upset conditions. And our fuel is much, much less. So the amount of radioactive material in each module is much, much less, about 1 20th of what you'd see in a large plant. So um, those features, plus the fact that we have no, we've eliminated lots of pumps and valves, and it's a much simpler system, really add to the safety of the design. Some of the major features of the safety, uh, we start off with our containment. I mentioned that we can go to much higher pressures in our containment. Uh, in addition, uh, we pull a vacuum on our containment. So what that does for us is that uh, we don't need insulation on our reactor vessel because it's basically sitting inside this thermos bottle. The second thing that it does for us is by pulling that vacuum, we've, we've greatly reduced uh, the amount of oxygen inside containment. So you might have heard about hydrogen production. So uh, under an accident condition, potentially you can generate some hydrogen. This design, there's not enough oxygen in containment to lead to a combustible mixture. So we've, we've actually eliminated that as a, as a problem. Uh, we've also, it's a continuous draw vacuum, so we're also monitoring for humidity uh, and making sure that we don't have any corrosion issues with our design. So the containment is, a, is a, a key part of what we're doing in terms of our design for the safety. Now when you shut down our nuclear reactor, uh, the reaction stops, the control rods go in, the reaction stops, so the uranium fissioning stops, but you have what's called a decay heat, a residual heat. 
and you have to be able to remove that heat over time. So typically today what they have are active systems, pumps, tanks uh, with connected to pipes, uh, to drive the flow and pro provide cooling to the nuclear core even after you shut down the reaction. And this, that heat can persist for quite a while. Uh, in our design, we've gone to what we call passively safe systems. So these passive systems, uh, we have two of them. One is our decay heat mode system. And in this uh, uh, orientation, we're, what we're doing is we're directing the steam from the steam generator. Uh, we've essentially isolated the module from the rest of the world. Uh, we've closed the steam valves and the, the feed water valves. Those are closed. Now that module, everything that you need for safety is right in that picture. Uh, I don't need any additional water. Uh, we don't need any pumps, any electricity. Uh, everything you need for safety is right there in the pool. Uh, so it's a much, much simpler concept. All we're doing is rejecting the heat that's being generated in the core through the steam generator uh, into these heat exchangers which sit in the pool. So during normal operation, the entire containment sits uh, underwater. If for some reason those aren't available, we have our emergency core cooling system, which allows us to uh, open up uh, the, the uh, top portion of the, uh, the reactor. You open up two valves. We only need one to open. It vents steam into our containment. That steam condenses on the inside shell of the containment and rejects all that heat right into the pool. And it does it passively. Again, no operator action, uh, no power needed to open up those valves. Uh, we've, we've actually reversed uh, the, 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 uh, in our design during normal operation, we're using power to keep those valves closed. So when you lose power, those valves spring open. And we can do that because it's such a very simple design. And we don't have thousands of valves to, to, to align in that way. So it's a very simple design. After the events of Fukushima, you can imagine you're starting up a company and you're saying, okay, things are going really well, and then Fukushima happens. You say, okay, now what? <laughs> well, I, I thought that was the end of, of New Scale. Uh, I was really worried. Uh, and what actually happened was, was really surprising because the phone started ringing off the hook. Uh, we were getting calls from, from Senate offices. We were getting calls from, from uh, newspapers. And uh, they had heard about what we were doing. And they were wondering how our design would function differently. And so we really spent a lot of time looking at the events of Fukushima. Uh, and we came up with what we call our, our triple crown of nuclear safety. So we're the only SMR, the only small modular reactor, in fact, the only commercial light water reactor uh, that can make this claim. Uh, and so I'm going to show you this, uh, this little video here. But basically, uh, for our design, uh, we can shut the reactor down safely. It will self-configure into a, into a long-term cooling mode without any operator action, any additional water, and without any AC or DC power. Uh, so we don't require batteries uh, in order to keep this, put this plant in a safe configuration. So here's the module. It's uh, during normal operation again. It sits underwater, uh, underground in a concrete uh, steel lined pool. Initially, uh, we've scrammed the reactor. So now we're going to, we, uh, the, the power drops. In one second, it goes from 160 megawatts thermal to about 10 megawatts. Uh, in one day, you're down to about one megawatt, which was the size of our uh, reactor at uh, Oregon State University. After three days, you're down to about 800 kilowatts. The power just decays off. Uh, and if you didn't do anything, you didn't cool the pool, you didn't add water to the pool, you just let it boil off, uh, after 30 days, you're down to about 400 kilowatts. And you have a huge amount of surface area. So you're able to reject all of that heat just by circulation of air on the outside surface of that containment. So a transition from water cooled to a boiling situation to air cooling, again, without any operation, uh, operator action, no AC or DC power, uh, and no additional water. So that's our triple crown of nuclear safety. Uh, and it, it, we're, uh, our engineers worked about eight months after Fukushima uh, to, to take care of the, uh, the, the one missing ingredient, which was DC power. And so that was one of the basis of, uh, of several of our patents was related to how we can uh, eliminate the need for DC power batteries uh, to get this into a safe, long-term cooling condition. We're the only design that has what we call an unlimited coping period. Uh, so again, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, it, we, when we uh, issued this patent, it, was, uh, it made the Wall Street Journal it was a lot of excitement. Okay, so we have a small reactor. Uh, we have these passive safety systems. Uh, we, we, we want to quantify safety for, for, uh, for people in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission who look at safety with, in terms of numbers. Okay? So we think about safety in terms of risk. 
and, uh, or the, the lack of risk. And so it's, it's, it has, there's two parts to that formula. One is frequency of failure. How often do events occur in your plant that can lead to core damage, to your fuel damaging? And if you do have an event, what are the consequences of those events? So those are the two, the two areas. So we've, we uh, run uh, scenarios pretty much monthly to look at every time we change the design or we finalize a particular valve or, or feature of the design, we calculate the likelihood of an event that would lead to damaging our fuel. So that purple dash line across there, that's the NRC goal, the NRC requirement. And what that means uh, in the y-axis there is that that's the likelihood of having an event that would lead to core damage. And so 10 to the minus fourth would be once every 10,000 years would you expect an event that would lead to a core damage. So you can see that the existing fleet uh, does well in meeting those. Uh, the operating pressurized water reactors, operating boiling water reactors do well. Um, the, the, the newest uh, light water reactor, the passive safety reactors, the AP6, uh, AP1000 for example, uh, and then you have new scale. We're down to about uh, 10 to the minus 8th. And each, we're tracking that number every month because we want to make sure that remains low. Uh, and so you can see that we meet the NRC requirements by a factor of, well, by four orders, of, four orders of magnitude. So we're way down there. So once every 100 million years, maybe, maybe, would that be one of our lifetimes? I guess not. <laughs> once every 100 million years, we'd expect an event in a new scale module that would lead to damaging your fuel. Okay, so we've really reduced the risk in terms of, at least that portion of the risk, the frequency of failure. But I think the bigger part of it is that we've also reduced the consequences. The fact is we have 1 20th the radioactive material inside of our reactors. Uh, so it's much smaller. So it's less of a source term. Uh, we also have, uh, we have the traditional barriers to fission product release. The fuel is in tubes. Uh, which sits inside of a reactor uh, vessel, which insi sits inside a containment vessel. And normally outside containment there would be the atmosphere. In our design, it sits underwater, underground. And we put a, a, a concrete biological shield on top of that. And on top of that, we've got this seismic category one filtered reactor building. So we've added additional barriers, or at least mitigation features, uh, to the release of radiac materials to the environment. So uh, we're quantifying those numbers now on the, quant on the consequences size side right now, and the numbers are looking extremely low. So that's a very, very good, uh, that's very good news. And we haven't published those numbers yet, but uh, I'm very excited about it. Okay, so how do you know your design works? Well, we have to test, and more testing, and lots and lots of testing. Testing, testing, testing. So uh, we've, uh, it, it's, 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 to me, this is the most fun part, <laughs> because you get to build it and try it out and see how well it works, and it works, it works real well. But we have, we've done a series of tests. We've, had to do, we have, we've done our, our fuel testing uh, at Stern Laboratories in Canada. Uh, we've done, uh, we have our integral system test, the, uh, the, the new scale integral system test facility, which is the one-third scale. Uh, we've upgraded that facility. We have 700 instruments. So if you've been there before, when you go back, you, you'll, you'll see some differences. Uh, we've, we put in a state-of-the-art control room. Uh, there's a lot of new features to it. We're going into our final phase of testing for the integral system. So we're putting in everything that we need to do to convince the regulator uh, that this design actually works and, it's actually, and it is safe. Uh, <clears throat> we've also got, uh, just uh, last week, we've installed our full-length uh, helical coil steam generator. So one of the things that we want to be sure worked very well was this helical coil steam generator which sits inside the reactor vessel. We need to have a high degree of confidence that that would perform, uh, give us the superheat that we wanted so that we can optimize our turbines. Uh, so it's been built. Uh, this just shows you the crane uh, lowering it into a 10-story test facility. Uh, and so that, uh, so here's the, they've got the installation going over here, coming through the roof. Uh, that's uh, an exciting project, and it's, that one's located in Piacenza, Italy. It's, it's rough duty, but I'm volunteered to go, <laughs> you know, to, to make sure that everything's going right, you know, over there. So we, we do have teams. We have several teams that go out there. <clears throat> they watch us. Uh, as the uh, things are being fabricated, as, uh, as instrumentation is being installed. It's all part of our quality assurance program that we have to maintain. So I'll be out there in May to, to look at them uh, actually fire this facility up. We're very excited about this. It'll, it'll really be our first full length uh, assessment of our helical coil steam generator. We're also doing some uh, flow induced vibration testing uh, with that facility. We have our uh, full scale, uh, well, 
control room simulator. So it, actually the size of that room is the size of the, the control room for the plant. Our, our target is to control all 12 modules uh, from one control room. We believe we can do this because it, the, each module is so very simple. Again, there's no react cool pumps on, on it. So you're, you're, you're doing a lot of monitoring. Uh, so each one of those stations represents the controls for one, one module. The central station, if you count them, there's 13. The central station, uh, it looks at the common system, the pool, for example, other common, uh, common uh, systems that, that all the modules rely on. Uh, the NRC, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, has, has sent teams out to, to run different uh, exercises with this. Uh, every time I, it's one of those really exciting places to go because every time I go in there, uh, they're changing the screens and, and trying out different um, human factors type of, uh, of, of, of uh, assessments. So what color should the screen be? Where should, how big should the font be? Where should it be located? How far from the operator's station should, should the terminals be? All those things are being tested right now. It's really, it's really interesting to, to watch that modern uh, effort in, in terms of making this a very seamless control room. And, and our, we have to issue a full report of this uh, completed study to the regulators to show them that we can safely operate the 12 modules from, from one control room. This is my disclaimer that I have to show because now we're being supported by the Department of Energy. So now that you've memorized that, we'll go forward. But I did want to allow some time for questions. So I tried to end just a little bit early here to, to give to you uh, some, some questions. Uh, any questions? Great question. Uh, it turns out that uh, th this particular group in Piacenza that works at Siet, uh, they've done significant work in building and testing helical coil steam generators uh, for many, many years. Since the late 70s and early 80s, they've been doing that work. So when we looked for expertise around the world uh, to see who could actually run these tests for us, uh, we found that uh, everyone on their team had at least 30 to 40 years experience. So we really wanted to get the best team involved in, in running these tests. They may not be, in the end, they may not be fabricated in Italy, uh, but certainly for this portion of the testing, we wanted to be sure we had the, the right folks working on it. Yes. The NRC accepts that test results? Uh, absolutely. So in order for them to accept the test results, uh, they have to be working under our, the New Scales Quality Assurance Program. So it's a very rigorous program, which means that we have to have people on site pretty much all the time uh, as they were fabricating and welding the tubes, as they were instrumenting the tubes, as they're installing the tubes, as they run the test, we have to be providing oversight for that testing. The NRC then will send a team to go visit and perform a complete inspection, which means every piece of paper, uh, all the instrumentation calibrations, every aspect of, uh, of that test program is reviewed by the regulator, and then they approve it. Now, the good news is we've been through two other uh, NRC inspections and we've done very well. Any other questions? Yes. No, it is, is a purified water. And in fact, chemistry control is a big part of, of that reactor. So, and not only is it, is it very pu it highly purified, but we add, for example, boric acid and lithium hydroxide to, to, for the pH control. So the chemistry of, of nuclear reactors is really an interesting thing. It's a, it's a field almost by itself. And it also includes electrochemistry. Good question. So, so molten salt reactors, if, if you're not familiar with that, that concept, there's different types of molten salt reactors. <clears throat> but the, the big advantages of some of the molten salt reactors is higher temperature. Uh, and, uh, and so you can go to higher efficiencies, for example. Uh, so I, I like that feature of it. Uh, I, it does introduce certain complexities and some challenges in terms of corrosion of materials. I think that's one of the challenges. And the other part of it, I think, is uh, familiarity with, the, with, the, uh, with operations of molten salt reactors. So light water reactors have a, a, a very long history, almost 50 year history, in terms of the materials, the chemistry, uh, and operators, are, we have about almost 100 uh, operating nuclear power plants. They're all light water reactor plants in the US. So the supply chain, if you can think about all the things that touch a nuclear power plant today, uh, in order to go to a different concept, like a molten salt reactor, uh, you have to be able to have all those other things in place uh, in, in order to move forward in that design. So molten salt reactor, conceptually, uh, a lot of good features to it. A uh, lot of big challenges, I think, in terms of, uh, of uh, supply chain. 
the regulator is not familiar with malt, uh, molten salt reactors, so I think that's a challenge also. Uh, they understand light water reactors and how to regulate light water. They've, all the rules are written for them already. So, so there's some challenges, but yeah, I think it, uh, in terms of the technology and the, the physics of it, I, I like them. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, so for our design, uh, we have a, a fuel pool, and it's, uh, I can go back a little bit here. We have a fuel pool, uh, which you can see over here, in this region here. <clears throat> now we have a fuel pool. Now our, our, our fuel is a low power density fuel. So it's about half the power density of a, a typical pressurized water reactor. So in terms of decay heat removal, there's less over time to, 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 to remove. In terms of... Uh, the amount of water, the, the, that four to one corresponds to this also. So we have about four times the water per megawatt thermal in our pool than a typical uh, pool. And we have enough storage there for about 10 years worth of fuel. Now in, in the US, we really don't have a policy yet, which is kind of surprising because when I became a student, I remember thinking, oh, that's going to be resolved here in one or two years. And it's, 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 it's not a technical issue, it's really a political issue. Uh, and if you, if you go to France or uh, other countries, uh, they actually will recycle their fuel. And I tell people, you know, <clears throat> in, in our fuel, uh, if you look at the, the energy content of, of a fuel after it's been used, you still have about 95% of the energy content uh, available in that fuel. Uh, so you, could, you could take it out, reprocess it, uh, put it into new cladding tubes and, and, and reuse it in, uh, in a reactor if, if you wanted to do that. Uh, so there is, that can be done. Uh, right now the policy is, and this is what we're doing here, is we've kept the same fuel matrix. Uh, after five years or so, we'll take it out of the pool. Uh, it will go on the site into uh, storage casks, which are air-cooled. Uh, and it, we have enough storage capability uh, uh, designed for our site to, to house about 100 years worth of, uh, of, of spent fuel until uh, the government makes a, makes a decision as to which way they want to go. Uh, but it, it technically, uh, if, you, if you, you talk to faculty at Oregon State University, uh, they've worked on uh, reprocessing techniques which leapfrog what's currently be done, being done right now. So there's, there's some good chemistry, uh, uh, radio chemistry being done, uh, not just at Oregon State, but around the world, which would really make that uh, uh, even more feasible today. So that's a good question. Yes. When you reach what? Oh, <clears throat> yeah. What we're uh, so uh, when we shut down the module, and we shut it down once every two years, and, and currently that that two year frequency is really a a, a federal requirement uh, in terms of inspections. So we have to do inspections every two years. Uh, the fuel could go much longer if, if we want to go to a, a higher enrichments. Uh, at the end of two years, we'll take that module out, we take it apart, uh, and we uh, re re will replace about half of the fuel. There's 37 fuel assemblies, so it's not a lot, and they're about six foot tall. So, six foot, yes, it's a little taller than me. <laughs> so, six foot tall, uh, and you replace about half of those, uh, and then you button it up, you put it back in the pool, and it's ready to go for another two years. So it'll produce 50 megawatts electric for 24 months, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, without having to refuel it. So it's, it was a huge advantage to be able to do that. It's a very, it's a very good source of base load power. Yeah. Yes? So um, let me see if I can interpret that a little bit. Um, basically, so if you have 12 modules, uh, on average, and I'll just say on average, every two months you're refueling one module, if you do it kind of in a really uniform, staggered manner. What will really happen is you'll probably, uh, depending on uh, what your needs are locally, you may just take two or three off at one time, and, and, or you know, in, in a near, near frequency, but you're only doing them one at a time. So again, it's a, if, you, if you think about 12 modules, you're producing 600 megawatts electric, you're only taking one module off, and while that module is being uh, refueled, the rest of the plant continues to produce power. So that's another 550 megawatts of continuous power. So you never really shut down the plant. You're just working uh, and re on refueling each module individually. 
Yes. Yes. We have very detailed costs. I wish I could share them. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because, uh, well, so my, my chief, so I'm the chief technology officer, and my chief financial officer is always telling me, he says, you can't share costs. <laughs> so I said, okay. But uh, it is competitive. In terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, of um, uh, the types of studies that we've done to assess, you know, whether it's competitive or not, we have very, we've, we've done, uh, a floor has actually done multiple bottoms up uh, assessments of, of, of costs. And over 85% of those cost estimates are based on actual quotes from vendors. So we're getting very good information. Uh, we've also taken those, those cost estimates, provided it to independent uh, financial uh, organizations who have done their own independent reviews and come up with, with similar numbers. So we feel pretty confident, but I, I probably won't be able to share those numbers with you. Great question. What are, the, what are the advantages of using nuclear power over other types of power? So I, I think, you know, the first thing is if, if you've ever seen a nuclear fuel pellet, and I understand in Utah they actually have uranium mines, which is kind of the yellow cake and stuff. But if you ever look at a completed pellet, it's about, it's about this big, itty bitty, about the height of a quarter, uh, and about less than half an inch, about three eighths of an inch in diameter. It's a little black pellet. That pellet uh, has the energy content of a ton of coal. So, one ton of coal. It also is equivalent to, uh, I think, easily several 50-gallon uh, barrels of oil. So, it, it's, I think the first thing is that the energy content is so intense. And you know, we talk about battery storage and what kind of power density you can get in a battery. Uh, there's no comparison about the, when you look at the power density in a fuel pellet. It's just absolutely enormous. So, for, for one thing, it's just that it's an enormous amount of energy that's available. The other part of it is, is that it can generate power on a continuous basis. So one of the challenges today, and we're looking at how we integrate our plant with renewables because we think that's important to do. One of the challenges with other forms of power is they either need large uh, land areas. Uh, so for example, we have 44 acres for, for, almost, you know, for 600 megawatts compared to if you look at wind farms or solar farms, a lot of land required for that. So that's a challenge. Uh, and also this, this can work at a very, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's a, kind of at, at a base load. Whereas the challenge with wind and, uh, and solar right now is just that it fluctuates. So when the sun goes down, you have to find a way of storing that energy. Uh, same thing with the wind. The wind, you know, you look at the cycles of how wind blows. So an advantage to the small, uh, to our design at least, because they're only you know, 50 megawatt modules, is that potentially we can do some load following, we can also do some integration with the renewables, which makes it a nice package. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, th I think by itself, uh, if you look at renewables where we are today, uh, by themselves, they, they really won't, they won't cover the, the energy needs of, of the nation. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a relatively small percentage um, and still relatively high cost. Uh, so I think there's, there's an opportunity here with, the, with this technology to kind of bring those together. Yes? Right. Sorry, That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So if, you, if so, what's really fissioning is is just a particular isotope of uranium. Uh, if you if you if you go and look at the yellow cake, the mines the mines in uh, in uh, in Utah, for example, uh, you'll find natural uranium, and natural uranium is is predominantly uranium two thirty eight. Okay. Now, what we want is, is something that will fission. So uh, what we found was that uranium-235, well, not me, but others have found many, many years ago, uh, that uranium-235 can actually, uh, is fissionable. And so you can actually enrich the amount of uranium-235, you know, the relative enrichments. Uh, and in the U.S., it's required that you maintain your enrichments below 5% uranium-235. So that's the, that's the legal limit. Our design, we're working somewhere around 3 to 3.5% enrichments for a two-year cycle and closer to 4.5% if we want to go for four years. So that's the fissionable material. So the uranium-235, uh, uh, when it gets hit, when it absorbs a neutron, uh, it'll, it'll fission, and you'll produce two different isotopes, two completely different elements, which is kind of cool. And it also releases, redu uh, releases quite a bit of heat, 
in that fission process. And th that heat, if you, if you calculate the, the, uh, the heat, uh, it's actually equal to E equals mc squared. So the, when you add up the sum of the parts, the missing mass is actually the energy that's released. That's, that's cool. Okay, that's why I came in. That's why I got into nuclear engineering and, and reactor physics. Because, wow, E equals mc squared. The mass is actually, it actually works. So that fission process is really just E equals mc squared. You're rejecting that heat. And also in that fission process releases two to three other neutrons. So those two or three neutrons go off. Uh, they thermalize and they interact with other uranium atoms. And then those uranium atoms split and they release two or three more neutrons, which causes other uranium atoms to split and, you, and actually will cascade up. And then the control rods, that's what's used to, to level out the number of neutrons. So the number of neutrons being produced is equal to the number of neutrons. Uh, uh, you, you basically have a, you, you have a steady state condition. So the number of neutrons in the population remains constant. So you basically have arrested that, that, uh, that growth rate and now it becomes flat because you've put in absorbers like a silver or indium, cadmium or, or boron to absorb a certain fraction of neutrons and that just keeps it level. And at a level, neutron level means a level power, a constant power. So that's how, that's basically the reactor physics part of the, of the thing. Yeah. Good question. Other questions? Now's your chance. Yes. So we're, we've designed the modules for a 60 year life. So these modules will last a long time. Uh, now you're having to refuel them every, every two years or so, but the, the, the actual vessels are, are for 60 years. The building, we believe, will go much longer than 60 years. Yes? Yeah, that's exciting. So what, in terms of, and we have, we have some experts up here who, are, who, who could probably talk better uh, regarding our first project. But uh, you know, because we're building this in parallel, we're manufacturing the vessels and modules in a factory, and you're doing the construction work on site, it's about a three-year build, a little bit less than three years, to, uh, to uh, build a, a, and, and bring a plant online. And that won't happen until after we have our design certified. So we'll submit our, all of our data, all of our uh, experimental uh, results, uh, about 12,000 pages worth of document to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, they'll review it for two to three years. Uh, and then once they issue the certification, uh, then we can actually start building the plants. So we submit the document end of 2016. They spend about three years. So 2019, 2020 is the earliest we could start building on a, on a plant. And I know that some of you have to go to classes, so I'm, I want to be sensitive to that. Is that okay? So if that, I think we'll end it. <laughs> okay.